them. Because of that, maybe it's because they're visually rendered. I don't know. But I believe if we can forecast the weather, we can certainly forecast an environmental and human health impacts. But it does take a different type of research and a different way of thinking about it. So that's one of my first messages, is that when you come early in these emerging technologies to ask technical questions, what you're going to find is that, yeah, you'll have a lot of uncertainty, but you also have to, you're after a different kind of thing because the decision isn't, okay, I'm already using this in a sunscreen, what do I do to mitigate risk? It's should I even use it in a sunscreen and if I do, what form? So let me go into that because that really dovetails with safety by design. So my first point is that I think doing risk research early stage has to look different. I don't think you throw, you know, hazard times exposure equal risk out the door, but I do believe the way you generate that knowledge for decision makers has to be different. So let's talk a little bit about safety by design because I alluded to it. Um, I had to use the word intuition because I don't know what intuitive toxicology is exactly. I'm sure I'm going to learn that. Um, but let me go there. So what we realized early on then, faced with the bajillions of different types of nanoparticles and circumstances, and did you really want to invest you know, the center's research in single wall nanotubes and find out in five years it's something else we're interested in, is that it actually took us back to some fundamental questions, fundamental science, actually. Because fundamental mechanistic understanding is general understanding. It helps you understand all of the possible situations, not just a specific one. So most of nanotechnology and nanoscience, I think this is my pointer, nope, there's my pointer, has been this process of understanding how the size, the surface, the features of a nanomaterial influence all of those properties we exploit in our applications. So this is the last three decades of nanoscience. And if you tell me the size, shape, and surface features of a quantum dot, I can tell you exactly how it's going to behave in an electronic or optical circuit. However, if you told me that same information, I could tell you about zero, about what it's going to do in a biological system. But there still should be a connection between structure and biological effect and ultimately chronic. This is an acute, but you can imagine chronic and many different mechanistic pathways. So a lot of what we do at Rice is to build these structure function relationships, which are not in, in different in ways I don't have time to go into from a quantitative structure activity relationship that is the backbone of our drug industry today. That's how we build drugs. That's how especially we minimize the toxicity of drugs. It's not a direct map onto nanotechnology, but there are some important conceptual links. I'm going to take you through one example just quick on carbon because it's a system that we're very identified with at Rice. We've studied it a lot. And I like it because it was totally counterintuitive. <laughs> so we picked um, C60 was discovered at Rice. The Nobel Prize for it in chemistry was given in 96 to Rick Smalley, Bob Curl, and Harry Croto. And its cousin, a single wall nanotube, you're looking at an end on view with some soap around it, a really important class of nanomaterials. They're related chemically. People who study C60 also often study single wall nanotubes. And this is a vial of one of them. They're black powders. We chose them for our first set of studies because our intuition was they were going to be really boring because basically they're greasy hydrophobic powders. They're these black powders that are never ever in a liquid state as they're produced. And if I put some into water and I looked at it as a chemist, that would not go and dissolve or do anything interesting in water. It would just sit there. So that was our intuition. They were going to be really boring in environmental systems because they were just going to sit there. They wouldn't transport. They wouldn't interact with organisms because there would be no solubility. Well, there's a lot of surprises in science. One of the interesting ones <laughs> was that uh, you hand this material to an environmental engineer, they have a completely different conception of solubility in water and accessibility in environmental systems. To them, what does you really mean by soluble? And did you let it sit in the stream long enough? What about UV light? So they did experiments like using co-solvents to, to introduce it into water. They also did experiments, no co-solvent, C60 dumped, let, let it stir a long time. They put it in dirty water that has natural organic matter. And guess what? The natural organic matter, kind of the soap of the environment, can actually facilitate its transport and its distribution to organisms. So interestingly enough, this material, which we really, you know, the chemistry point of view is it wasn't going to be soluble, is incredibly, actually quite soluble under many circumstances, and was going to be very possibly mobile in the environment, but certainly be able to interact with species of a variety of types. So there's a lot of different work here. And I'm going to talk at the end about the controversies. But to make, you know, just to kind of capture one data set, um, a lot of the focus has been on aquatic toxicity of the carbon systems. And so you're looking at, you know, a developmental um, 
Talk study. It's a very la large and lavish study, but this is just a picture of one little zebrafish em embryo. And this is a, a different kind of indicator. It's an indicator for basically did it get Lung, lungs fill with fluid as it was growing. And the hours, yeah, upon exposure to this material, that can happen. Um, it's mitigated with glutathione, which is an antioxidant, which is one of the themes of a lot of the carbon nanostructure aquatic tox work, is that it can definitely have an effect, but you can also get rid of it by adding antioxidants. There's a lot of mechanistic studies that went into why and how this material has these effects. Um, and it's a very interesting set of data, but it suggested to us that one of the reasons was that this material tended to collect in the fatty tissue of the embryos. And so what we did...